Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou among them. Bless the fruit of thy Jesus. Holy Mary. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faith. On kin within us, the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. <clears throat> Let us pray. O God, instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit. Grant that by the same Spirit may be truly wise, and that rejoice in his consolation. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Lady, help of Christians. <clears throat> St. Joseph, St. Ignatius, St. Faustina, all God's angels and saints. The Lord be with you. Amen. Reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its taste, with what can it be seasoned? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city set on a mountain cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp then put it under a bushel basket. It is set on a lampstand when it gives light to all in the house. Just so your light must shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your heavenly Father. The Gospel of the Lord. Good evening. <clears throat> like uh, last week, I'd like to make a parenthesis uh, from our study of St. Faustina because uh, today we celebrate a great saint. So I'd like to uh, talk about the saint that we celebrate today. And the saint that we celebrated last week is very much related to the saint that we celebrate today. Uh, you'll see why before the end of the talk. Okay, today we celebrate uh, the feast day of the great Saint John Bosco. Okay, Saint John Bosco. He was born August 16th, 1815. He died January 31st, which is today, 1815, 1888, very heart of the 19th century. Thinking about the pro-life movement, and one of the principal reasons why they have recourse to abortion, those who are as they call themselves, pro-choice, is quality of life. Uh, Bosco, his social circumstances did not allow for quality of life at all. He was born in dire poverty. His mother couldn't read and write. Father died when he's about three years old. So from all exterior circumstances, his life was probably going to be a total disaster. 
you look at it through the light of um, natural reason. But it turns out to be, according to my humble opinion, the, the most bright and shining star in the world in the 19th century. I think it was the greatest in our world, I would say, in the 19th century. Okay. His uh, mother was illiterate, but she was a very holy woman. Name of the mother was Mama Margarita. She couldn't read and write, but she was a true woman of God and talked to her children often about God. She would often utilize images from nature to talk about God. Don't forget she can't even read, so the book that she's going to be reading is basically the book of nature. So Mama Margarita is going to be forming one of the greatest men in the history of the church. His schooling was basically little to nothing. He was autodidactic in the sense that he learned how to read by himself. Someone gave him a book and some encouragement, so he learned how to read by himself, and he became a pretty avid reader of the books that he'd be able to get upon, lay his hands upon. He had a keen sense of right and wrong, and a lot of talents. Without a doubt, one of the most talented saints in the Catholic Church. Basically, everything he did turned to gold. He was able to do everything, and not, every, not only everything, but he was able to do it to, the, to perfection. He had a great hatred for sin. And um, if you read his life, his life is fascinating. Probably the best life I've ever read a, Bos a Bosco would be a man named Alfred, who was a, an Indian Salesian priest that lived about 100 years ago. And he's written other commentaries on um, the life of Bosco that actually uh, Lupe Galvan gave to me. Alfred. He like, um, I think all of your people here, he had a photographic memory. <laughs> you have a photographic memory, but it hasn't been developed yet, right? <laughs> So when he, he heard a sermon, he could repeat the sermon verbatim, which means word for word, as all of you can do when you hear my sermons. <laughs> Thanks be to God. So what he would do is he would actually ask the children in his village to come and he would repeat the sermon the priest lady that they heard the Sunday before and he gave them a treat. He would have been uh, he would have been an expert in Barnum and Bailey's three ring circus. 
He could walk on the tightrope. He could do juggling. Later on in life as a priest, when he's a man, he could take a walnut and crack it with his two fingers. <clears throat> Imagine that. We can't even do it with a nutcracker, but he could take it. <clears throat> <clears throat> it was so strong that he could take a walnut, which is a hard nut, and he could crack it with his fingers. He went about, so this, uh, I'm going to go through his accomplishment. I'm, I'm going to tell you some, some stories in his life because his stories I find to be fascinating and very uh, catechetical, very easy to memorize. If I were not an oblate, I would probably be a Salesian, probably, because the person of of Bosco, it just it, it fascinated me even when I was a teenager. You know? Okay, so here's one of one of one of the um, probably most one one of the most well known stories of Bosco when he was a child. He had a very keen sin, sense of sin. He wanted to avoid sin himself, but do all, do all that possibly could to help others not to sin. So, <clears throat> one Sunday, the circus man enters into the town. And the circus man is doing all these stunts, and the children are just riveted they're fascinated by these stunts that this circus man is doing. But as a consequence, they didn't go to church. They didn't go to Mass. So he was preventing these children from carrying out their moral obligation on Sunday. So Bosco... I don't know the exact age, but he's probably like 10 or 11 years old, maybe 12. He decided to challenge this guy. And that if Bosco uh, lost, he would, be, he would be ready to serve this stuntman. But if Bosco won, the stuntman would have to get out of town so he wouldn't prevent him the children from missing Mass on Sunday. Okay, so he challenged him to three stunts or three activities. The first was It was a foot race. Ready, set, go. Bosco left him in the dust. Second was to climb a tree. So the guy climbed to the top of the tree, the top branch. Bosco went way beyond into the very top and the tree was, was swaying back and forth. And the third was a jumping contest. So he could jump the furthest. So the circus man jumped and he jumped all the way to the ledge of a brook where the water was running quickly. So it looked that Bosco was not going to be able to win this one. So Bosco ran and jumped, and he jumped all the way over the brook. <laughs> so you know, he, 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 he killed him by a landslide, the last one. So Bosco just said, look, you know, I won. Get the heck out of here now. And all this was done to 
prevent these children from going to hell, right? Prevent them from missing Mass. Prevent them from failing to carry out the Third Commandment. Keep holy the Lord's Day. She has a very keen sense of justice, of morality, and keen sense of sin, even when he was, even when he was a child. Okay, one of the stories of his life that's um, it's a very good lesson for us is this. When he was a child, one uh, an older man in his presence told a dirty joke. Later on in his life, when he was a priest for many years, he still could not expunge and erase that dirty joke from his memory bank. Fifty years later. So my friends, we have to learn how to think before we speak. We have to learn to be more prudent and discreet and recognize that our words do have an effect on other people. And the effect can be very long lasting, could be good or could be evil. Now, not everybody has a, a, a photographic memory like Bosco, but some people have pretty good memories. I pray that we only leave people with good things, that our words would serve to edify others, to instruct, to enlighten, to encourage, sometimes even to correct. John Bosco had dreams or visions. If you want, you can order um, from 10 publishers, you can order the 33 dreams of John Bosco. They really are fascinating. I read that he had these dreams. God spoke to him in dream because he's too busy during the course of the day. So God had to use his sleeping hours to communicate to him. First dream was he had a, he had a, he had a he had a dream of these surrounded by these wild animals, and he intervened. And it turned these wild animals were wild teenagers, and he came in and tried to use a lot of violence to calm them down. And then the good shepherd appeared to him and said, she will teach you how to control these wild animals. And it was Our Lady Help of Christians. He was going to control these wild animals, which would be these teenagers. But not by force, not by violence not by drastic means as such, but by gentleness, firmness, kindness, and love. That would be the charism of the Salesians. Okay, when he was heading off to the seminary, there this son, relevant radio this morning. He was so poor that he had to buy um, some used shoes on the way so that he'd be able to arrive at the seminary not barefooted. No? So he was <laughs> shoeless Joe Jackson. I mean, he was poor. They would have nights where they wouldn't have anything to eat, the family. 
See, see how this is going to work because who, who are the ones he's basically going to, going to be educating and training? The same type of kids. Nothing happens by chance, no? So he enters into the seminary. Father Benedict Rochelle, commenting on this, said it was one of the worst seminaries in Europe. So that didn't help to his theological, philosophical formation, did it? No. So it seems as if everything was against this poor guy. In the seminary, he did his best. I'd like to tell you one story of something that happened in the seminary. His best friend was a guy named Luigi Comolo. And Bosco admired him because Luigi Comolo practiced more penance than Bosco. He was fasting and practicing penance and a lot of mortification. And Bosco, not that he was a he was a slouch, not at all. But they they also made a deal that whoever died first, the other one would pray for the uh, the survivor. So Camola got really sick in the seminary. This was Bosco's best friend. And his sickness went from bad to worse. And when he's dying, he's begging Bosco to pray for him. So Comolo dies. And Bosco prays fervently for this companion. I think a couple of days passed. Bosco was in the seminary dormitory, and all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, he heard something like horses in a carriage rushing through the seminary. And he heard it several times, so a really loud noise. You've all heard horses rushing with the carriage behind it, the noise that that makes. And after he heard that, that kind of scared him. Then all of a sudden, there was a moment of silence, and he could hear it in a loud voice, Bosco! Bosco! Bosco, I'm saved! Wouldn't that be great after you died? You appear to your loved ones and say, Anne Marie, Anne Marie, Dan, Mary, I'm saved. Hope that when we, when we die, we'll all be able to say, Friends, 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 I'm saved. Prince of One Foundation. That Bosco had a very robust constitution. He actually got sick after that. The whole experience had such an enervating, psychological, spiritual effect upon him that he could barely move. I heard this story on Relevant Radio about a year ago, and I, and I, and I remember reading it 40 years ago. No? I, I really like that story. Let's pray that when we die, we'll be able to come back and say, Lord, I'm saved. It's the only thing that really matters. I'm saved. Long life, short life, riches, poverty, health, sickness, honors, humiliations, doesn't matter. What matters is that we, we are saved. Do you agree with that? We're saved, that our children, our grandchildren are saved. Nothing more important. Amen? So let's move on.
St. John Bosco had a spiritual director who was a canonized saint. And he was very different than Bosco, but a very able spiritual director. His name was Saint Giuseppe, Saint Joseph Cafasso. Any of you ever heard of him? No. Okay, Saint Joseph Cafasso was his spiritual director. They, they, the Italians called him the, the priest of the gallows. You know why? It's because back there a lot of people were, were, um, were hanged and he would always go to the gallows in the prisons and he would be able to convert them before they died. they make a confession. I think, I remember reading his life, there was only one guy that didn't seem to open up to conversion and I guess he was an instrument of I mean, hundreds, hundreds of, of hardened criminals kind of like Pranzini in the life of St. Therese. But Cafasso, um, Cafasso did this. When, after Bosco was ordained a priest, Cafasso told him, spend another year studying before you enter into your apostolic life. The reason being is that that seminary formation was not sufficient. And I think that he was already anticipating that Bosco was going to be carrying out a very important role and he had to have a good, solid formation. And he obeyed. You could Google this in sometime today or tomorrow, but um, Cafasso is going to die and Bosco is going to be preaching in his funeral mass. Yeah, you, it's about a four-page, um, I remember reading this many years ago, but it's pretty touching, the praise that Bosco gives for this real man of God. But I don't think it's surprising how one saint is helping to form another saint. And Bosco is going to be forming another saint. His name is Dominic Savio. And Miguel Rua will be, right, Lupe? Miguel Rua will be the father rector major after Bosco Day. He's blessed, by the way, Miguel Rua. Miguel Magon, I think he's also blessed, who died when he was a teenager. How one saint helped to form another saint. Wouldn't it be great that you could try to help to form other saints? Amen? Amen. Amen or oh me? That's an amen, right? Yes. One spouse will help the other spouse to become holy. Some of you are saying yes. I really, I'm really working on it. I'm really helping them to practice patience. <laughs> <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> Okay, so after the formation is over, you have the famous Bartolome Garelli experience in the sacristy. Remember that? He was in the sacristy in Turin, and the sacristan was running after this teenage boy, about to hit him with a stick, and Bosco stops the sacristan saying, what are you doing? See that, that kid, he's just a, he's just a, a nuisance. And Basso says, he's not a nuisance, 
he's my friend. So he comes back and he starts to talk with him. He said, what's your name? Bartolome, Bartholomew, Gadelli, where do you live? What are you doing? Come back next week. So next week he came back with, with guess what? With another friend, right? So he brought others. And then the following week, more came. So the young people were growing and growing and growing. And this is what Bosco would do. I mean, just an excellent educator. He would combine, these are teenage boys, he would combine religion, prayer, the sacraments with basically having fun. Great educator. He said, come on now, boys, uh, let's, uh, we're going to pray four rosaries, going to make two holy hours, we're going to read the uh, 150 Psalms, and then I'll give you a cracker. No? <laughs> Soggy cracker. It's not going to work. So, have you read his life? So, on sun Sunday was a big day. What would he do? He'd take them out to a nearby field and he would sing with them, pray with them. Then they'd be playing, they'd be playing basically the whole day. He would say mass for them, closing prayers. Then he would give them some type of catechesis. This is his style. So guess what? It just multiplied the number. And don't forget that these, these, these would be basically Hawaiian Gardens Cholos. You know what that means. They, they would be basically gang members. Okay, a little bit, a little bit of history and sociology. See how God works. I think we have to pray that God will use us to save a lot of souls too. And not say manana right now. Okay, the 19th century was a very important century because there were huge sociological transformations. Because up until the 1800s, especially Europe, was a very rural agrarian society. So that means they had farms, they had their animals, they had their livestock, they had their grain, they had their wheat. That was the society. <clears throat> and the parents would have big families. Catherine Siena was one of 25. So, what happened was, the word in Latin is urbe. They're transferring from the farms to the center of an industrialization, which would be the cities. So as a result of this, the, 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 fam, the, the families were divided. And the families were divided, you had these teenage boys that basically had no supervision whatsoever from their parents. They didn't have the school system like we have today. Basically the boys were just wandering the streets of the big cities. Starting with London, okay? And then Turin. If any of you, you know, like literature, Charles Dickens is basically writing his, his novels in defense of the children against some of the negative fruits of the Industrial Revolution. This is Charles Dickens. One of the most piteous poems of the 19th century was William Blake, The Chimney Sweeper. 
remember I read this my first or second year studying literature, and I mean, I almost broke down in tears. Any of you read it? Chimney Sweeper? Okay, I'll give you a summary of it. And Blake, Blake is stronger than Dickens. He, uh, he, he presents in, um, in, not in prose, but in poetic verses of, uh, this is piteous. You have a child with a broom. And he's three to four years old, and he's lifting up the broom, and he's cleaning the chimney in the houses there in London. What's going to be coming out of the chimney? The smut, right? So the smut is going to be falling down. This kid is doing it for eight or nine hours. You're a doctor. What's going to happen if he's breathing that in? What's going to, is he going to have pulmonary problems? He's not going to live till he's 18. So William Blake writes this you know, really powerful, I remember studying this maybe, you know, 40 years ago, but it left an impression upon me, called The Chimney Sweeper. So the Industrial Revolution moves from Italy, to, uh, rather, rather to England, Italy. It's going to spread all over Europe. And these children are, are displaced. So God raises up Bosco as a response to these, this sociological concept of industrialization. See how the working of the Holy Spirit. So he sets up this fun time for these uh, teenage boys. Then the, the government, the city, starts to complain because it's becoming unruly. They're getting so many kids. So guess what? They got to get a center. And they finally, he's finally able to find a place where they can actually live. It's called an oratory, an Italian oratorio, same thing in Spanish. So there you have the foundation of the oratory. And there the boys are, they've got lodging. And Bosco insists upon forming them spiritually, morally, their character, and teaching them basically trades, that they could be cobblers, or they could be bakers, they could be uh, these uh, very important traits. But his favorite boys would eventually become Salesians, the best students, the most spiritual. The, the cream of the crop <laughs> would be his followers. No? So there you have the formation of the, the famous oratory. Okay. The numbers increase, increasing by such, so many numbers that he's gonna have to open up all other oratories. The first one is going to be opened up in Turin, where the body of John Bosco is to the very day. Our Lady Help of Christians. But aware of this problem, there are other young men that are gravitating toward him. And he's inspired, Bosco is inspired to form a new congregation. And the name of the congregation would be, probably you know, the Bosconians, right? Like Franciscans, Dominicans, Augustinians, Bosconians? No, they are called the Salesians. Anyone was anyone present at my, uh, my conference last week? 
who did I talk about? Francis Sales. So the reason why he chose the name Silesian is because he admired so much St. Francis de Sales. So they're called the Salesians. So he's the founder. Founder of other, of, of other young men who wanted to follow in his footsteps. And the basic charism of the Salesians is the formation the moral formation, the formation of character of children as well as teenagers. It is the th third biggest congregation in the world today. Started by someone who was brought up in dire poverty. So you've got the Franciscans and the Jesuits. One and two, then the third would be the Salesians. He met, his, he met a stocky, strong, spirited, holy woman. And it surfaced, why not form, why not form the, the woman's branch of the Salesians? And guess what? It was founded by another saint. And this is one of Raquel's and Herodotus' fa favorite saints, right? I think Her Herodotus was reading her life yesterday. And it would be, of course, you can say it out loud, Herodo, Saint Maria Mozzarella, right? One of your favorites, right, right Herodo? See you, Padre. So you have John Bosco founds the, the, the male and the female order, but the one that he gives responsibility is a peasant woman who's named Santa Maria Mazzarello. Okay. So you had all these, all these saints that are being brought up in this time to found congregation to help children as well as uh, teenagers. Okay, some of the okay, so, some of the many gifts of John Bosco. Okay, so I'd like to go through some of his um, some of his incredible gifts that God gave to him. Are you listening? So let's uh, let's write down or let's try to memorize. Hopefully, the gifts. One I mentioned earlier is that he had he had a photographic memory. It ever occurred to you maybe ask St. John Bosco to help your memory? Yeah. Yeah. He can help you. So he would read and hear something and it was like, it was like a photo, photocopy machine. Boom. Who else had a photographic memory? Aquinas. Who else? Fulton Sheen too. Ask him to help us with our memory. Number two, I, I live in Italy for close to seven years. And one of my seminarian friends said that they would actually read the Italian of John Bosco because his Italian was so clear syntax, the verbs, the style, that they'd actually read John Bosco as a model for Italian. Like the Charles Dickens of England, or the Cardinal Newman, if you like him. So he was a, he was, he was a gifted writer. And in my studies, uh, he, he, he wrote more, more than 60 books. Where on earth did the guy find the time? And he wrote books on everything. 
church history, cookbook. I mean, he just, he, he could write on everything. And everything he did, he did to the T. Among my most famous, or my favorite, would be when he's writing hagiography, which would be the lives of the saints. Of all the writings of John Bosco, my favorite, to be honest with you, is the life of Dominic Savio. Years ago, I was, I was preaching on this, and the lady said, well, what, what would you like for your birthday? Well, give me the life of Dominic Savio. And she bought me like 25 copies in English and another 25 copies in Spanish, no? They still have a couple of my, this is a good maybe 15 years ago. They've always, I've always loved Dominic Savio. That was the first life of a saint that I read when I was about 13. But it wasn't, it was, it was not written by John Bosch, it was written by uh, Peter Lapin, which means French for Peter the Rabbit, okay? So he wrote, he, he wrote extensively. Another, another gift that he had? John Bosco was like Padre Pio in this sense. It probably never really occurred to you people, but John Bosco spent many hours in the confessional. In my confessional, um, I got uh, various pictures of John Bosco. There over the file cabinet, I have one kind of hidden behind the cross of St. Benedict. And it's a picture of John Bosco out in the fields. Have you seen it? Yeah. He's out in the fields and he's just sitting there and there's, he's got one boy that's coming, he's close to his ear, he's listening, and they have a whole line of kids that are waiting to go to confession. He tried to be available to confess the boys in the oratory, promoting it to the max. So many of us don't see John Bosco as a great confessor, but he's probably one of the best in the midst of his other obligations. Okay, like Padre Pio, John Bosco had the gift of reading minds. Did you know that I have that gift too? Yes. <laughs> Not yet. Maybe one day. So if someone would go to confession, and they wouldn't tell all the sins, John Bosco would intervene and say, look, you, you didn't tell me that sin, you committed adultery three years ago with that woman, no? It's a great gift, isn't it? Padre Pio had that. You see the movie of Padre Pio? You know, shortly before his father died, his father, was, his father left the faith. When he was dying, Padre Pio intervened and said, look, Dad, you're going to die. You better go to confession. I'll hear your confession. So he went to confession, and he said, hey, I forgot to say, adulterio con la americana. Committed adultery with that American woman during the Second World War. No. <laughs> so he had the gift of reading minds. He also had the gift of prophecy. Let me tell you a story of um, one of his prophetic announcements that's it's scary. But it shows, there's all these stories of John Bosco, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, catechetical truths behind them. Don, uh, St. John Bosco, they, they called him, if you like in Spanish, Don Busco. Don Bosco, Don Busco, which means He'd always be buscando dinero, okay? going after money for his, um, for his enterprises. So he went to a rich lady's house, and he knew, this, he knew the son of this rich lady. And the son was a teenager, according to Bosco, he was very good, and he could be, he, he would be a very good prospect for the vocation, a very prospect to be a priest. 
So Bosco enters the house with two purposes, to ask for money for the poor, but also to tell the, the mother that you know, her, her son could be a really good priest. So he says this to the mother and says, you know, your son be a great priest. She says, over my dead body. I prefer him to be dead rather than be a priest. Dead silence. Bosco said, your word will be accomplished. So in a very short time, she called Bosco and said, my son is sick. Please come. Time went on, got sicker and sicker. Please come to heal him. Bosco never went to the house and the boy died. Powerful story, isn't it? No? You know, we got to kind of think before we speak and not always think on a natural plane. Think rather on a supernatural plane and not always on a natural plane. Hold back our impulsivity, our impetuosity. Think, speak. Other gifts? The next time you go to Italy, go to Turin and Roma. You're going to see there some of the most beautiful churches in the world. Ever been to Rome? Ever see the, the Church of the Sacred Heart in Rome? Built by Don Bosco. You been there, Anne-Marie? It was built by Bosco. The, well, the, the pope, what the Pope did was this. The Pope would ask Bosco to raise money to build churches because he knew the Bosco was the, was the best one to do it. So a lot of these churches and, and Our Lady help of Christians in Turin. Those are two of the, two of the most, among the most famous. He, he would start, he wouldn't have a penny. Churches would, they would be worth millions and millions. They didn't have a penny. But he had a lot of trust in divine providence. And he would go to richer people and say, look, can you give me some money because we want to build this beautiful church? The Pope wants it. And he would get a lot of money. So here's a charism of John Bosco. He was an excellent beggar. Are you? We should be begging for grace, right? Yes. Begging for our children, begging for the salvation of sinners. Another gift? For this gift uh, we should pray for as catechism. Some of us work with the confirmation kids. Every one of the boys in the oratory, they were convinced, and there were a lot of them. They would say, Father Giovanni Bosco, ah, he's my best friend. Yeah. A, a, a canny gift. In other words, every one of those boys, and there were a lot of them, they were all convinced that Father Bosco loves me more than anyone else. I've often prayed uh, since I've been here. I, I pray for the gift. I pray for the gift to be like Bosco. You know why? I deal with so many teenagers. Who is the confirmation teacher that has most students in the parish? Got three classes. Got a class today, the advanced class. I got forty students. Biggest class in the parish. I'm not saying that I'm a John Bosco, but 
I'm an oblate. But I've always felt this, begging for the grace to be, to, be, to be able to adapt, adapt to the people, to the custom, to the language, to the idiosyncrasies, to the social mores, no? Everything adapt. As St. Paul says, I, I pray for this grace, to be all things to all men so as to able to win many for Christ. They'd be kind of like a spiritual chameleon. You know what a chameleon is? I've never seen it in California, but you know, like a little lizard, it, it changes color according to the te texture. Do they have them in the Philippines, Felipe? No. Don't know what it is, probably, no. It looks like a lizard, but it becomes green if the ground is green. It becomes brown. Shouldn't we pray that we become spiritual chameleons? Bosco was able to do that. Bosco could sit down and talk with the most highly educated people in the world. He could sit down with a six-year-old boy and talk his language, and the six-year-old boy felt he's my best friend. It's called the spiritual of adaptation. So the exercises I, I have created, this is a annotation 19, I created it for the people in the modern world. I think it's pretty well adapted. Other gifts. Bosco, ba ba Bosco had um, the ability to preach. He would go on missions. He was able to captivate the people by his preaching. He was able to teach. He's the patron of educators. You, I think, you studied with it with the, with the Salesians. It's called the preventive system. What is the preventive system, Lupa? You've heard of this. It's better to better to prevent a young man from falling into moral degradation. Prevent. So in other words, take the, the kids under your wing and love them and form them and mold them so that you don't have to pull them out of gang activities in the life of debauchery or degradation. If you read the Salesian Spirit, it's called the, the preventive system. Medicine, better to prevent the sickness than to cure it, right? Better not to have the broken leg than to heal the broken leg. Hmm? Well, I find ba I find Bosco fascinating. And you know what he do? Another thing which is key to the Salesian charism is um, to, during the recreation in the patio, that was one of the key times to evangelize the teens. A Bosco would be walking in the courtyard during the hour break, whatever it was, and he'd come up and he'd whisper in their ear or he'd give them a little note of paper. And it, it would almost always be some spiritual uh, verse or proverb. Come up to this boy, time to go to confession. Next one, life is short, don't put off your conversion. Another one, love Our Lady, help of, help of Christians. Another one, confess all of your mortal sins. And he would just whisper it in the ear and they'd be meditating upon it during the, the rest of the day, mulling over it and assimilating it. What a, what, what a master. Okay, now, another gift that he had is a gift that none of us probably want. Years ago, I remember talking to Father John Lyons on this topic. He was reading his life. And uh, I don't remember reading this in Alfred. It was probably another author, because there are many books written on John Bosco. Is 
his um, his gift of of being able to suffer. And John, Father John Lyon was saying, you know, his book pointed out that basically from the top of his head to his feet, I mean, it was almost every part of the, his body had some type of ailment. Most of us don't beg for that gift, do we? No. Okay, well, let me tell you one story on that. Have any of you ever had migraine, uh, a migraine headache? Andrew? Yes. Do you like that? No. <laughs> it's hard, isn't it? No? Well, we have to learn how to offer it up, right? Not, not, to, not, not to waste it, but united to Christ. But he would have, he'd have headaches. And, and you know, one of the clearest signs of sanctity is the fact that he suffered all these and nobody knew it. When we suffer, da 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 da! <laughs> Hear the trumpet out, da 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 da! I'm suffering today. <laughs> Difficult to keep it to ourselves. So, uh, on, on, one, on, one, on one occasion, He had headaches, but this time he had a he had a, he had a toothache. And I've had a couple of, of root canals, and no joke. You know what that is? <laughs> I'm almost glad that when I go to dentists, they haven't they've never pulled out the wrong tooth. I hope they never do that. Okay. So his suffering was pretty intense, and one of the boys in the oratory heard about his toothache. So he went up to Boston and says, hey, you know, look, I'll take it. I'll take it. And Boston said, are you sure about that? Yeah, you know, these guys here are kind of wimps. I'm, I'm strong. I'll take it. I said, are you sure about that? I'll take it. I'll take it. So Vasu says, okay, you, you really want it. Uh, take it. So he, he transfers his suffering to this boy within a few seconds. Ah! <laughs> take it away. <laughs> Hear that, Felipe? Did you hear that? Jaime, did you hear that? So that 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 ability to, to suffer and no one no one even knew about it, except this one case, is extraordinary. Okay, try to imagine tomorrow you get up and you're blind. At the end of his life. John Bosco, like St. Francis of Assisi, couldn't see in one eye, and the other eye was pretty dim too. Varicose veins. So he had all these, all these infirmities, but one of the, tr one of the chief charisms of Bosco was the radiating joy that he he, 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 he just rated joy for everyone. And he insisted in the young people, you have to be joyful. Is it important to be joyful? It's important. When we have joy, the devil has no power over us. But when you're in desolation, that's when the devil goes after us and tries to kick us into a pit of despair. We give up. What else? 
So John Bosco built churches, built a congregation, congregation of men and women. He wrote books. He was an athlete. He was a preacher, a teacher. But more than anything else, John Bosco had a great, great love for God a great love for the church, and a great love for the salvation of souls. About 10 years ago, I think it was, there was a first class relic, a bone of John Bosco, that was in Salvia, right? About eight or nine years ago? Okay, a few years ago. Did any of you go to see it? I went to see it. On his wall, in his room, was his motto. What was his motto? Give me souls and take all the rest away. Young teenager entered into his room and asked, what does that mean? Give me souls and take all the rest away? That's my motto. And that little boy said, I am the cloth and you are the tailor, make me a saint. The name of that boy was Dominic Savio. After Dominic Savio died, and this is another key gift of John, the Bos John Bosco, one of the foundational charisms of John, the Bos John Bosco. Savio appeared to John Bosco after he died. And he was bantering with him, kind of having fun with him. What do you think was my greatest joy in life? Ah, probably your prayer life. Yeah, but something else. Maybe your penance. Yeah, something else. I know. Your charism with the other boys, that you're able to bring them to confession, bring them to God. Yeah, but something else. And finally, Bosco said, well, Dominic, I can't think of anything else. What gave you greatest joy in the world when you lived? And he said, my great love for the Blessed Virgin Mary. That was my greatest joy. He said, go out you and promote great love for Mary. Our Lady, help of Christians. So I hope and I pray that all of you will go back to your homes tonight with a new friend who loves you very much and wants to help you, support you, encourage you, children and teenagers. My friends, we got to walk with the saints. So hopefully St. John Bosco now is going to become one of your best friends. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among them. Bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sins. Now and at the hour of our death. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. God bless you.